morning. Welcome to worship on this, the Lord's Day, a special weekend in the life of many people on this Labor Day weekend, marking the end of summer and uh, the beginning. It's always a new beginning, so that is what the church is about, that new beginning that we have in Christ. Only one announcement that I have, just a reminder that next Sunday we will be, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper here in this service. And we had the Lord's Supper earlier today at the first service, and it went very well. And this is what you will find when you come up. It, it looks like a little chalice, and there's its self-contained bread in one side, wine in the other. And you'd simply open up the wine or the bread side first, and then the, the wine. And we will have people that will be here to assist, because some of these have been just a little bit stubborn and, and didn't want to be open. So uh, we have people available that will have gloves on, and they'll be able to assist you if you need it. Um, more on that for next week, but the uh, Lord prepares our hearts to receive his blessings, and we are very blessed by that. Uh, that's all I have for announcements, so we will join together now in singing our opening hymn. Most 
merciful Father, we come before you and admit our, our sinfulness. In our thoughts, words, and actions, we have failed to do what your word demands. We have not honored you fully with our lives, nor have we loved one another as you have first loved us. In the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask for your forgiveness. Because of our Savior humbled himself for our sake upon the cross, enable us in true humility to receive the remission you promise to your remnant children. Amen. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. God the Father has taken your sins and laid them upon our humble Savior Jesus Christ. Because of Christ's sacrifice, God does not count your sins against you. He has taken them away. He remembers them no more. He preserves and delivers you as his child forever, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, from, from whom all, all good proceeds, grant, grant to us your humble servants, your holy inspiration, that we may set our minds on the things that are right, and by your merciful guide, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament lesson for this morning is from Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 7 through 9. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And the epistle is from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not love your neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. At 
that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, and put him in the midst of them, and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck than to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that none of you despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to save the lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine in the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the message this morning is from the Gospel lesson recorded in the 18th chapter of St. Matthew. Dear Christian friends, where do we even begin? It's Labor Day weekend, and I think one thing we need to remember is in the midst of the rest that the world is looking at, God gives us this time to rest and to receive and to be blessed in his presence. But again, where do we begin? Ezekiel, warning the wicked, blood on their hands, the epistle from Romans, Obeying civil authority, that sounds like something we should be talking about. Or paying taxes, something we never want to talk about. There's a lot going on here. Even in this 18th chapter of Matthew, our Lord Jesus seems to be kind of jumping from one topic to another and back again. The chapter begins with the disciples asking Jesus who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus presents a very small child, an infant, as an example of greatness. Letting them know and letting us know that greatness is so much more associated with humility and trust. So much more than it is in position and power. But then it seems Jesus turns his words and he comes up against those catalysts of temptations to sin. Using very harsh language that it's better off entering heaven without eyes, without arms, without feet. Better to enter heaven without those parts than that those parts be used to sin. Then he goes back to the little child again and talking about lost sheep. And it concludes on a discourse on how sin among the church is to be dealt with. That's a lot on our theological plate for this morning. We're supposed to be at rest. And here we are all tensed up. Wondering where, where do we fit in in all of these things? But let me assure you that in these seemingly disconnected series of things that are thrown at us from Scripture, that there is a common element. Something that ties them all together. And it is something that we cannot live without. We do without things, right? I got a short list of things here. Meat, dairy, eggs, oil, cheese, pizza, mac and cheese, fried chicken, donuts, pastries, pies, cakes, and cookies. <laughs> All those things that will be on your plate later on today. Those are things I have had to live without. You may have heard that, that pastor eats weird, yes. <laughs> Not by choice. Well, it was my choice. Right after the doctor told me, don't eat that stuff. And it was to my benefit that I could live without those things. Literally, I could live if I set those things aside. No regrets. And I thought it would be interesting maybe to do a survey in our nation, maybe even among us today, of those things that we can't live without, those things that we think we can't live without. Emphasis, I guess, is important because if I said emphasis on the word live, then the answer is easy. From the physicalness of the human condition, air, food, and water, right? Without those things, we don't live. But what about changing the definition of the word live? 
If by live we mean eternally, in heaven, then as the body of Christ, we know the answer too is easy. We can't live forever unless God sends his son to die for the sins of the world. And in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and we are eternal heavenly beings. What the question really should be, maybe for purposes of beginning this morning is, those things in our life that if you did give them up would cause you such great stress and anxiety. Because we know the basics, air, food, and water. We also know forgiveness in Christ. But what are those things that are holding us and controlling us? What if you made that list and you were honest? And I mean honest in the fact that if you were to make a list of those things that maybe top three, top five, whatever, and you put them in list of importance, that which dictates your life, what would they be? Now, you're in church, so I know the first thing on your list, you would think I better put God. But be honest. If coffee comes before God, Put it there, at least temporarily. Coffee, sports, vacations, whatever. The question is, in that mental list, would it be an accurate reflection of the way we live? There needs to be that honesty. The honesty that comes to the point that says, yes, we put other things before God, which means we have to repent. And that brings us to that one thing that we cannot live without spiritually, eternally, and that is forgiveness. Scripture bears it out over and over. The truth of the importance of God's forgiveness. The other truth is that in our world, greatness, as the world defines it, can be gained without forgiveness. But remember what Jesus said in last Sunday's Gospel. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? So this whole 18th chapter, even though it seems to be going back and forth, is really all about only one thing. Forgiveness. Forgiveness how it is received. Forgiveness how it is lived out. Forgiveness and how it is given. The disciples want to know, who among them is the greatest? And Jesus says, it's not you. You're not <laughs> We place such emphasis on the Powerful and the prestige and what does Jesus use? The question the disciples want to know, who's the greatest among us? And Jesus says, the greatest is not among you. And he pulls up a little child. <coughs> a little child. The word is paideia, meaning real small, infant. Why would Jesus use an infant as a depiction of the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? We see weakness. Jesus sees trust. That little child trusts their parents. The infant trusts their parents to provide all things necessary, so we are to trust not in ourselves, but in the one Heavenly Father who provides for us. Simple, unchanging, unshakable trust that comes from the stronger to the weaker, so that the weak would become strong. That's what we have in Christ. 
the one that trusts and follows him, has come to the realization that they need that one thing that only Christ can give, and without that we cannot live. Because in Christ, what? Scripture says we live and move and have our very being. Jesus knows the importance of it because he knows that temptations will come. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is always the lure towards sin. So dangerous. So dangerous is the giving in to temptation that Jesus uses those startling words. Cut off your foot. Cut off your arm. Gouge out your eyes if they are causing you to sin. We understand the hyperbole there. We understand what he's saying. We're not going to physically do those things that hurt us. But we're going to do those things in response to his admonition to flee from that which leads us away. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If we walk in him, we have light. So the opposite has to be true. If we are walking away from Jesus, we're walking into darkness. Jesus tells us about that thing with which we cannot live without how it means to us in the church and how that gets extended to our brothers and sisters. In the example of Matthew 18, if someone sins against you, go to them lovingly and tell them to repent because you care. That is the intent of God through the church that sin, that poison needs to be removed and turned and to find, once again, the grace of God. We can't live without it. And God wondrously and miraculously and abundantly gives what we can't live without. Next week is such a special day, long time coming, where we will receive that which God says you can't live without. Because where the body and blood of Christ is, there is forgiveness, there is life, there is salvation. So please consider that offer from your Savior to come next week with open minds, open hearts, open hands, and open mouths to receive the gift of God, the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, that you may rejoice and be glad to all eternity. To God be the glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please stand. In the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We join together now confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. Father Almighty, Lord of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. And we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O oh Lord, Grant that your people would be granted courage, that with boldness we would speak your name and witness, and warn sinners that they may come to faith and repentance, and so enjoy that forgiveness that you so long for all of us to have. Grant to your church wisdom and strength by your Holy Spirit, 
that we would be steadfast and unmovable in your word and in your truth. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And, O oh Lord, we pray that you would be present among your people to serve us with the gifts of your grace. Grant that we may receive them with joy. Grant pastors and church workers who will minister in your name and strengthen the faith and life together of your baptized people. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And grant to us, Father, good and honest leaders who will govern according to your word and according to your will. Give us grace that we may not fall to pray to those who lead us into acts as bad citizens, but we would follow in the way that serves neighbor and serves one another. Give peace to the nations. Bring an end to the violence, the prejudice, the destruction. Guide us to know and respect all life, from the infant in the womb to the youth beginning maturity and to the mature and the aged. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. And, O oh Lord, you send the rains upon the earth. You turn seeds into plants rich with fruit for harvest. Accept our thanks and praise for your continued goodness in providing a bountiful harvest and food for all. And grant to us wisdom that we may use these resources wisely and extend your care to those who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. Father, you are the strength of the weak, the consolation of all who place their trust in you. <clears throat> Grant your comfort to those who grieve, peace to those who are near death. Hear us on behalf of those we name before you in our hearts, who are afflicted in body and soul, that they may be sustained in the midst of their affliction, comforted in life and in death, and delivered to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. Lord, you have given the day for work and the night for rest. Bless all honest labor and industry, artists and artisans, those who are in the caring professions. Keep us in humility and guard us against pride and arrogance. And grant to us a spirit of generosity that we may share with others the blessings that flow to our neighbors from our labors. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And Lord, teach us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. Bless the fellowship of the forgiven, that we would be united in doctrine and in life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we pray that you would deliver us from pandemic and pestilence, from disaster and danger, from sudden death, that kept in faith we, we may be preserved through this mortal life, and in death be received into the arms of your mercy, and into that blessed rest of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Hear our prayers, Lord, as they are brought before you, not by our own merits, but only by the mediation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, praying together now that prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace.